Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining me. My name's Sarah Frost, I work for Nature Trek, the wildlife tour operator, and I lead some of our cruises all around the world. And the cruise that I'm going to be talking to you about today is one that's particularly close to my heart, which is St Kilda. I must say it's a real novelty for me to be doing a bird fair presentation from my kitchen. Um, I certainly can't wait to get back in the marquees, as I'm sure you all can't as well. Uh, so fingers crossed for next year, uh, but this is certainly a first. Uh, so traveling to St Kilda, this is the Outer Hebrides and we start our journey from the vibrant um, and colourful town uh, of Oban, known as the gateway to the, to the Outer Isles, to the Hebrides. And it's a, a fantastic place to have a little look around and uh, start our trip. And just to give you an idea of where we're actually trying to get to with St Kilda, this red cross here shows how far out the islands are from the rest of the Hebrides. It'll take us three days to get there with overnight stops. And so it should, in, in my view, a dedicated journey over the Atlantic waves. Um, it's what the islands demand of any traveller wanting to visit them. Uh, and the islands lie 64 kilometres uh, out from the westernmost island, which is North Uist. And the difficulty of reaching St Kilda, because the surrounding seas are notoriously fickle, is to be honest, part of it's allure. People around the world have long held an affection with its poignant history, its dramatic scenery, and the spectacular seabirds and unique isolation that it has there. And this is the vessel that we use to journey there, um, the Seahorse 2. She is a fantastic size, 10 berth boat, so nice and small to have a lovely camaraderie and nice atmosphere on board without feeling like you're on a huge cruise ship. Um, and she's small enough that we can get really into the, the nooks and crannies of the locks and anchor in beautiful, tranquil little bays. But she's big enough and robust enough that should we have um, any you know, inclement weather, which obviously is very rare in Scotland, um, then she's sturdy enough to get us over the waves with no problem. And just to show you some of the interiors here, this is one of the twin cabins and the bathroom. And uh, you can see the saloon here, uh, cream tea there on the bottom right, and the uh, boat anchored in Tobamori up at the top right there, uh, where you can sit out and enjoy coffee. So we set sail from Oban, which is the red mark, uh, red cross on the map there, and we sail up the Sound of Mull, which is that stretch of water north, uh, on the northeast side of Mull. And that's where we should start seeing our first wildlife. There should be harbour porpoise around, uh, which look like small dolphins. They are different. They're only about a metre and a half in size, whereas the local bottlenose dolphins are about three and a half metres. We'll see stags uh, breaking the skyline with their huge antlers. Um, and hopefully our first white-tailed eagles as well, which of course were reintroduced very successfully um, to the Scottish Isles. And we'll overnight in Loch Sunart, which is a, an absolutely gorgeous place, extremely tranquil. This is what it looks like. I took the photograph when I was there last year. And this is a fantastic spot for us to try and have our first otter sighting. Um, this is a photograph that I've taken of one there. Um, and otters are easier to see at low tide when they don't have to dive so deeply for their food so we can sit out on deck um, and watch for them during the evening and you can often see them swimming about as they're diving for butterfish and octopus and, and crabs and things. And the next morning we'll sail from Loch Sunart down to the Treshnish Isles and why do you think we go to the Treshnish Isles? Puffins, I heard you say. Yes, fantastic. We go to see the puffins. This is a, a fantastic place to see these wonderful confiding birds. And we get there extremely early. One of the benefits of um, having our own boat, it's our own private charter, so it's only Nature Trek guests which are on this boat, is we can get there early before any of the tourist day boats get there, uh, which they arrive around 10 o'clock, but we can be there at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock and have the puffins all to ourselves and just walk around and have a really wonderful intimate atmosphere with these gorgeous birds. As we continue to sail, we should start to see some more cetaceans um, and hopefully we'll see some bottlenose dolphins. 
Uh, you see this video here of the dolphins. These are bow riding on the from the front of our boat. And um, this is a pod of bottom those dolphins called the Barra Boys, um, which are usually seen around the Isle of Barra, which is uh, on the Outer Hebrides. And they take it in turns to ride on the bow of our wave. It's a pressure um, on the wave of our bow, sorry. And it's a pressure wave which pushes them along in the water. So you see the ones that are all right underneath the boat. They don't really have to push or swim or kick with their tails at all. They're just getting pushed along in the water, which looks quite fun, doesn't it? It's fun for them to do. Um, but also they're really curious. You can see them turning on their side, uh, looking up to us to see what, what we're doing. And they're pushing each other out of the way because they want to uh, each have a turn under the, the pressure wave there. And I just took that with my mobile phone as we were sailing over there um, a year ago. Um, but also there are common dolphins, which is the top image, um, and white beak dolphins as well, which are a specialist cold water dolphin, which we would hope to see too. Um, and then we continue sailing. We go up through the Minch. This is this big gap of sea there um, in between the Outer Hebrides and the, the small isles where you can see. And we'd hope to see some bigger cetaceans. And this area is a good spot for minke whales. So we'll keep our eye out for those. And um, they're here feeding in the rich waters over the summer. Um, and they have their, their young here as well. And then after a few days, um, we see St Kilda on the horizon. It's tantalizing because you see it on the horizon for four hours before you actually get there. Um, but the moment where it, when it's first sighted on the horizon, the electricity that just goes around the boat, the atmosphere is just amazing. It's infectious and everyone is so excited on deck watching it just go cl closer and closer and get bigger and bigger as we sail there. And this is St Kilda. Now, the structure of St Kilda erupted from the Atlantic Ocean um, 55 million years ago um, in six ancient weathered islands um, and towering sea stacks are what remain um, of this eroded volcano. You can really see and how it was originally a volcano from the, the caldera that remains. And it's home to the highest sea cliffs in Britain uh, 430 meters on Herta, which is this main island, which is in the right hand side of the image, those sea cliffs. Um, and their high topography has actually created their own weather system and clouds actually form over the islands. And so it receives more rain than the surrounding seas. And the, it's surrounded by just bountiful ocean waters, which makes it fantastic for bird life. And of course, uh, we get off and explore. We have two nights at St Kilda. Um, and that allows us to have a full day exploring the island and, and walking around. And just sitting there listening to the birds, screaming and squawking is, is fantastic. You, look, you sit at the top of the island, uh, looking on the horizon, north, east, west, south. No matter where you look, you just can't see land. You really get such a sense of true isolation. And it's no wonder that people did used to say it was the edge of the world. And what we do is we'll do two different walks and um, we can do a, a gentle walk up, uh, a leisurely walk um, up the one single road that is on, on the island. Um, or we can do a more sort of fast paced group um, and we'll split into two um, and those who want to go up the sea cliffs can do. And then we'll meet in the middle uh, for lunchtime and have a picnic lunch and just do bird watching uh, around the cliffs. And we'll also do some exploring of the village as well. Uh, when you can get a really good view of it from standing up on the sea cliffs. That top left image there just shows the ancient settlement um, from where the St Kildans did live and famously evacuated in the 1930s. Of course, special species that are on the islands of St Kilda, there's the St Kilda wren, Troglodytes troglodytes hertensis. So this is slightly larger than our Eurasian wren. And what amazes me about this little bird is we're sailing around the sea cliffs and the stacks and above the noise of the sea um, crashing against the, the cliffs and, and on the shore. And you've got thousands of gannets, of guillemots, of fulmers, of, of gulls screaming um, over the, the sound of these waves. Above all of that, even louder, you just hear the song of the wren, which is amazing. It's a an amazingly powerful song coming out of a, a tiny little bird um, and it's a, a, a it just jars with you hearing this song when you're out at sea and of course the famous soe sheep are there as well these are um, completely wild and left to their own devices um, and are formed in part of a genetic experiment which the volunteers on the St Kilda are doing to see how their population 
is coping with being completely genetically isolated. They have no new individuals coming onto the island um, and having to breed with one another. So uh, that's forming part of an interesting scientific study. They're extremely tame um, and have no fear of humans whatsoever. And of course, there's a huge amount of history on St. Kilda. Now, the, the lifestyle of the St. Kildans was one of really, truly remarkable self-sufficiency. There were only about 100 people that lived in the village at a time with population fluctuations, depending on outbreaks of, of disease or famine. This photograph here um, shows the morning meeting where all the men would gather uh, on the street and decide what jobs needed to be done. They're gathering along the black houses, um, so-called because they were uh, black with soot from the, the fires that they had in there, and they would share their, uh, their stone houses with uh, uh, livestock as well. Uh, with relatively small windows. Notes that none of them actually are wearing shoes apart from the first uh, chap on the left, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, and this is how they would, they would organise themselves once a day. And I, I always get a bit of a shiver when I look at this image because when we land on St Kilda, we go and stand in this very spot here on the street and I, I see I can see the men uh, almost looking at me, standing here on the street. Just it's so easy to imagine them having these these morning meetings and going about their daily lives. And the buildings are amazingly well looked after. This is the school. A bench here, just enough for about six pupils to have sat on, um, and uh, an old map there of, uh, of South Africa. Um, and this is the extremely informative visitor centre, which has amazing artifacts of their tools, of their clothing. And another interesting things that have been collected and preserved there for you to actually have a look around. And you could spend hours just in there, just reading about all of their, their lifestyle. And of course, the St. Kildans were known and famous for feeding off the, the seabirds that they had there. They didn't do a huge amount of fishing. Um, and of course, they had no trees growing there for firewood. Um, so things were really quite limited in terms of their resources, but they were very good at uh, collecting whatever they could that washed upon their shores and catching seabirds. So they would use um, poles with uh, wire and um, um, string on the ends of them to catch birds. So this chap in the top left has caught a puffin. Uh, this photograph in the top right shows a huge pile of gannets um, which they have caught and they um, would start to pluck the feathers from them and actually sell the feathers to pay for, for rent and trade it for food and things as people started to visit the islands. Um, and they had cleats dotted around the hillside, which are stone shaped igloos, which they would use to store these gannets and the meat um, and the feathers for harder times. And you can see on the bottom right image there, they're welcoming some visitors um, that have just come along. Now, communication on St Kilda was really a bit of a, a tricky one. Um, you know, you didn't have any methods of doing it. If you were to try and light a fire and, and signal that you were uh, in danger, no one would be able to see it. But what they did do was they created a, a wooden boat, um, which is written on it, please open, which is engraved uh, by with a knife and it used an inflated sheep's bladder. Um, and they would just push that out into the water and hope that someone uh, would, would get the note. And amazingly, this apparently worked uh, one third of the time when they actually sent these notes. Uh, the other two thirds of the time, it would rather inconveniently end up somewhere in Norway. But on more than one occasion, this saves them from severe starvation, sending a note like this, uh, which would go out into the Outer Isles and wash up somewhere um, on North Uist or something. Um, and these photographs here show the famous evacuation of St Kilda. You can read into this photograph what you will, but we've got two chaps here loading this lady uh, with all of her, uh, well, they're probably their possessions to, to take out. And uh, another photograph here um, of the same thing, a lady carrying out uh, this, their possessions while the men sort of uh, stand around and have a little chat about it, um, hopefully give us some good words of encouragement. Um, and after a, a two nights on St Kilda and a full day there, we then set sail and we go around the sea stacks. And this really is the thing that is special. If you look at this picture closely, you'll just see a load of dots, which looks like a swarm of mosquitoes. But this is thousands upon thousands of gannets. And this is the special moment of sailing around those stacks. 
tens of thousands of gannets flying overhead. And if you look really closely when you're out on the boat, you'll often see the dark shadow of a great steward, a bonksy, flying overhead looking for an unsuspecting gannet that it can pester um, and get to regurgitate its fish. The pirates of the seas, they of course steal fish from other birds. And all of that white that you see on that stack there, stack Lee, is gannets. 60,000 pairs, in fact. And it's estimated that over a million seabirds actually call the islands of St. Kilda their home. 60,000 pairs of former, which is the largest colony of this species in Britain. Uh, 150,000 pairs of puffins, and that's a quarter of Britain's population. And um, loads of other orcs as well, razorbills and guillemots. Um, and it's just a phenomenal place to travel around. Um, and then um, we have to head home, but hopefully on the way home we will see, um, continue to see lots of cetaceans. Um, and of course we continue stopping off on the islands as we have done on the way over. And this is Eriske, a beautiful island. And these Hebridean islands just have such a way of looking so appealing and tranquil and remote and welcoming. And indeed they are. Uh, walking along this, this island here um, and this beach where you've just got swathes of, of maca, of the wonderful flowers, and you hear cuckoos flying over, um, you may see golden eagles, white-tailed eagles, um, it's just absolutely phenomenal. And here are some wonderful examples of the flowers as well, lovely thrift, um, the bottom right there, and then orchids, uh, the maca top right, um, yellow flag irises, is a stunning, stunning place to go. And 15 minutes can absolutely not do this uh, cruise justice. And I could easily speak for 45 minutes on it, but I hope that that has given you a taster as to what it's like uh, traveling to St. Kilda in a very, very small nutshell. But if you are interested in learning more about it, please do go to our website and search for St. Kilda or just get in touch with us and we'll be happy to chat to you about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>